Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Professor Sides and this course is Principles of Microeconomics. We are in Chapter 6, Supply, Demand, and Government Policies. Chapter 6 is an extension of Chapter 4 and in the previous chapter you will remember that we looked at the market, what it is, and how it operates on its own. Chapter 6 continues by looking at what happens when the government, through laws and policies, intervene in market operations. As we look at different types of policies, and we'll talk about those types in a few minutes, we will see how the effects of government interventions are sometimes different from the original intent. Now, when we talk about the reasons why the government would intervene in market operations, and remember we said that that is the buyer and the seller, the transaction between a buyer and a seller for goods and services. When we look at why the government would intervene, there are four reasons why they would. One, because market, they assume that market prices are unfair. The second reason for intervention would be to, that resources need to be protected. The third reason would be to raise revenue for public goods. And the fourth reason would be to influence the market in a specific outcome. Again, these laws that the, or policies that the government would implement in order to intervene in the market is for one of four reasons. Either because the market price is unfair, the resource, there are resources that need to be protected, we, um, the government needs to raise revenue for public goods, and public goods are those goods and services that the government provides. Example would be national security, it would be education, it would be uh, protection by, via the fire department or the police department. These are goods or services that every citizen enjoys, but and just because you enjoy it doesn't preclude me or is not exclusive to my also enjoying it as well. And then the fourth and final reason is because there is a market outcome they want, the government would like to see happen, and so they want to influence that outcome using um, policies. Now, when we talk about uh, the government po policies and laws, there are two types of commonly used policies. They are price control and taxes. And remember from chapter four, markets are used um, to organize economic activity. That's why when we have when we speak to, which is what we're going to speak to in this chapter, about government intervening on the market, there are some economists and some policymakers or politicians who believe that the government should not regulate or intervene or minim, min, minimally, excuse me, intervene in market activity. Again, the, the two most commonly used policies that government will use when they are intervening in a market is price controls and taxes. There are two types of price controls, price ceiling and price floor, and we'll speak to taxes um, in a, later on in the lecture. When we talk about um, the difference between a price ceiling and a price floor, I want you to visualize a physical ceiling and a physical floor. When we speak to a uh, price ceiling, that is a government mandated price, which is set uh, sometimes above equilibrium price or market price, sometimes below, but a price ceiling is the maximum price set by the government that the buyer or the seller, excuse me, the seller can set at his or her good or service. So if the government comes in and says, you can only sell your price, the maximum amount of dollars you can sell your pro product or your service is X, that's a price ceiling. Likewise, if the government um, comes in and sets a minimum price, that would be a uh, price floor. And they would say that the least amount that you could sell your good or service for is X or Y, um, then Y becomes the price floor. And then again, later we will talk through um, taxes. If you all remember um, from chapter four, we have our diagram, our market diagram. This is a market diagram. And in the market diagram, we have price, 
um, which is the price of the good or service being sold, the quantity or the amount, and then we have demand, remember downward sloping, and then price upward sloping. Here we have the where the intersection um, between the supply curve and the demand curve, if you remember from chapter four, that that intersection is where the supplier and the and the buyer the the buyer and the seller agree on a price to transact a good or service that interaction is called equilibrium remember from chapter four we also refer to it as market so the market price or the equilibrium price in this example is eight hundred dollars and the market quantity or um, the market quantity or the equilibrium quantity is 300 and this would be without any type of government intervention the buyer and the seller negotiated and in their negotiations they negotiated 300 a quantity of 300 at a price of 800 dollars now that was chapter four in chapter six, visually, what we see here is that the federal government comes in, or it could be a state or a local government, but generally when we talk about price ceilings and price floor, it'll either be the state government or it'll be the federal government. But in any event, the government comes in and says, the maximum amount you could sell this good or service is $1,000. Now, if you notice, the price ceiling is above, the price ceiling is above market price. The buyer and the seller had already agreed that 800 was a fair price. Then the government comes in and says, the most you can sell is a thousand, um, sell, the price is at a thousand dollars. And um, as you, we will talk about this later, at a thousand dollars, remember the, the law of demand, the relationship between price and quantity, the higher the price is, the less we want. So if we would go at a thousand dollars, the demand would be less than 300 and the supply would be more than 300 which is why they negotiated and came up with 800 now when the government set this price up when they set this price ceiling because the price ceiling was above market price we call this not binding and it is not binding because it has no effect on the market outcome. Now, the buyer and the seller had already agreed on, a, on $800. Both are happy. So the government coming in and saying, you can set it, you can set it at any price up to a thousand. They've already set it at a price up to a thousand, which was 800. And so they would keep it. It would be in their interest, the buyer and the seller's interest to keep it at 800. As you can see here, the supplier would definitely like the price of $1,000, but the buyer would not want to buy as much at 1000 So since they would both stay at 800 there's no effect, or we call it not binding. Now, if the price ceiling is set below market price, as we have here, the government the market price is 800 the government says oh that's too high let's set it let's set the price ceiling at 500 then what we see here is this is called a binding constraint when it's set above market price it's a non-binding constraint there's no constraint because there's no effect but in this instance because the price ceiling is below the market price we have a binding constraint because it does affect what is so it does affect the market for example when the government sets the price ceiling at 500 suppliers only want to sell this amount but buyers want to buy more and so what you end up having having in this case is a shortage because in this instance at 500 suppliers only want to supply 250 buyers want 400 so 400 minus 250 means you've got a shortage because you've got more people, more uh, demand than supply. Now, let's talk about the long run. That's the short run effect. Let's talk about the long run effect of price ceilings 
when, price ceilings when they're below market value. Again, as you see, we have short, we have a shortage, but as you can see from the previous, if you remember from the previous um, diagram, over time, more there's more and more shortage. And so um, at, at some point, uh, your buyers will either change their taste and preference, remember demand curve shifters, or they will continue to deal with, um, with the shortage and then suppliers may alter their uh, what they try to supply but even if they did again they would only be able to set so much and again over the long run you still have a larger shortage now what happens when you have shortage now remember you want you the consumer want more than what's available if you the consumer want more than what's available supply then, and we have a shortage, that's a, what the definition of a shortage, then what ends up happening is, is that suppliers will ration out their supplies. They won't sell everything all the way, all, all of their um, supplies. They will not sell, sell all of their inventory. They will sell a little bit at a time, over time. Um, here are some examples you will see when it comes to rationing, um, some mechanisms that, they, that suppliers use for rationing. Um, one of the first ones is, and more popular one, is long lines. And then we also have some forms of discrimination. For example, um, each time App Apple comes out with a new phone, they do a mass marketing, media marketing campaign. And you'll see people stand outside of an Apple store, sometimes days before the iPhone or the Apple product is available, they'll stand in the line, long lines, days in. And so you have to, uh, going back to basic economic terms, look at your opportunity costs. Are you willing to give up time sitting, standing in a long line so that you can get that iPhone or that iPad? So long lines is a rationing mechanism. And then we also have discrimination according to a seller's bias. For example, um, ladies, Louis Vuitton does not like, um, they have a limited amount of handbags that they will produce. And so they will discriminate against buyers who like their product by setting the price at a certain, at a certain place. Um, another, that would be if there were, that's without, uh, without a price ceiling. But if we had a price ceiling, then they may say, um, a, a discrimination would be we're only going to if we're we can only sell the bags for say two hundred dollars then we're only going to sell them in certain neighborhoods or certain stores we're only going to have our stores in certain locations so we might have a store a Louis Vuitton store in New York and LA and Miami but not have a store in Chicago or Detroit or DC or Dallas and so we would discriminate according to the seller's bias, or you could expect to see long lines as far as rationing is concerned. This concludes our um, first lecture in this, in this chapter, and we're talking about price control. We're talking about um, taxes later, but we're talking about price control and the effect that price control has on the market. I look forward to speaking to you soon.